2008 as Exploration Director and has been closely involved in an exciting period of growth, assisting the company to take advantage of a raft of exploration and acquisition opportunities. Over to you, Mike. Thanks, John. Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, this is not the first time First Quantum has uh, attended the Nickel Conference. It's the first time I've given a talk. Um, I think all the previous talks were given by uh, engineers and uh, other people that talked about uh, thousands of tonnes of concrete and steel and all sorts of other interesting uh, commodities that go together to, to make our projects. Uh, so you're going to get a slightly different picture from me today. Uh, I'm aware that uh, the audience includes quite a lot of geologists and many of whom I know. Um, so we'll, there will be a little bit of geology and I'll try and keep it away from just brown mud at Romesthorpe. Um, and talk about a few other things that are happening in the uh, first quantum portfolio around the world, uh, which you probably won't be aware of. Um, so, of course, uh, in Western Australia, uh, the uh, first quantum story is Ravensthorpe. Um, we don't have any other uh, producing uh, nickel uh, mines in this part of the world or indeed elsewhere in the world. But most people know us best for our copper portfolio, which is uh, ever growing, uh, close to uh, 800,000 tonnes of annual production, I think, in the next year. Um, and now eight operating mines around the world. Um, so only one nickel producing asset at the moment at Ravensthorpe, but a number of others uh, to come. So uh, you have to read this and report back later. Uh, you can find it on our website if you don't have time. Um, operations around the world, eight operating uh, uh, mines uh, and only one of those nickel. Um, I've highlighted on that slide just uh, a number of uh, uh, things in red, uh, which are our nickel opportunities. Uh, one in Zambia called Enterprise, which many of you may not have heard of, uh, but it's actually quite significant. Um, and, uh, and one other project here in Western Australia that uh, we're involved with at the moment. Uh, and everything else in our portfolio is either copper, copper gold, uh, or in some cases uh, we produce a minor amount of, uh, of zinc as well. Uh, but I won't go into those projects today. So let's look at Ravensthorpe. Um, I was involved in the original due diligence at Ravensthorpe uh, just over a decade ago. Um, and I must say at the time I was a bit skeptical of getting involved with this thing. Um, it's, uh, it's quite a beast, as you may be aware, any laterite uh, nickel uh, processing uh, operation uh, is a relatively complex uh, operation. Uh, it was built by BHP in 2008. They mothballed it yet less than a year later in 2009. Um, we purchased it uh, in 2010 for 340 million, which is uh, fair to say is a fraction of what BHP spent to, uh, to build it. Um, we then did a fairly significant redesign of the front end of the plant because actually the chemical end of the plant, the back end was working fine and BHP sort of knew what the problems were, but I don't think they had the, uh, uh, the willpower really to go in and try and fix it by that stage. Um, so uh, it was about a redesign of the front end, particularly the, uh, the crushing, blending and beneficiation uh, part of the circuit, uh, which we'll come back to later on because it's actually a really important part of why Ravensthorpe is special and why, why it works. Um, we commenced operations at Ravensthorpe in 2011 um, and it produced very successfully, peaked at about 38,000 tonnes of nickel a year, which for anybody involved in nickel production in Western Australia at the moment, realise that's a pretty big number. Murrah Mine's currently doing about 36,000. All of the BHP Nickel West operations do around 74, 75, something like that. Um, so uh, so 30, uh, 38,000 tonnes of nickel is what Ravensthorpe is capable of. Um, and this year, we've been in uh, the process of re-energising uh, re it through a major new development uh, on a new ore body called Shoemaker Levy, which I'll, I'll go into a little bit later. Um, during the nadir of the nickel price in uh, 2016 through 19, we made a conscious decision to shut the operation down uh, and put it on care and maintenance for two years. The nickel price at that stage was sub $5 for a fairly consistent period. Um, and clearly, when you're running an operation like Ravensthorpe, uh, it's very hard to produce uh, at much less than about $5 a pound uh, nickel price. Uh, we managed it, actually. I mean, production costs were in the order of uh, $4.50 a pound for, for a while. Um, so, uh, so we took that opportunity not just to uh, sit on our uh, hands, but actually to do a full uh, drill out of the Shoemaker Lev Levy ore body, uh, which is a very major uh, new uh, asset for the mine, uh, and indeed to do some uh, much needed maintenance and so forth on the fairly complex uh, processing circuit. Uh, we did all the permitting and so forth for Shoemaker Levy, such that when we restarted uh, in, uh, in May of last year, uh, we were able to really throw ourselves straight into the new development of, uh, of Shoemaker. Um, 
Just recently, the new news is that we sold 20% of Ravensthorpe as part of an off-take deal with POSCO, um, a very uh, large, uh, dominantly steelmaking group in Korea, uh, but also a group that is very forward-facing in terms of its uh, uh, commitment to um, uh, battery uh, technology uh, and raw materials for the EV uh, market, uh, as uh, many nickel producers are uh, uh, are moving towards. Um, so we sold 30% of an asset that cost us 340 million for 240 million. So that's not a bad equation. Um, so Ravensthorpe, uh, most of you know where, where it is if you're in Western Australia, and I'm assuming most people here are. Um, it's down on the south coast. It's actually a pretty nice place. Um, and uh, along with that comes a great uh, legacy of environmental responsibility uh, to make sure that uh, this operation runs uh, very effectively. Um, Interestingly, as I'll mention in a moment, uh, it is one of the more environmentally sustainable sources of nickel, both in Australia and globally. Um, some quick facts, and this is the bit where you can just read this or um, listen to this uh, and then fall asleep because it's uh, the post-lunchtime session. So very briefly, it's a, a very large, uh, moderate grade nickel ore body uh, in laterite, two, two types of laterite, uh, the limonite and saprolite. Um, the total resource, uh, about uh, 212 million tonnes in uh, measured and indicated, uh, and a further 100 million tonnes in uh, inferred resources. The average grade in situ is about 0.6%, uh, which doesn't sound particularly high until you realise that actually this ore is quite special and it can be beneficiated so that you don't have to feed all of that ore into the plant. Uh, so the current reserve, just under 200 million tonnes, um, at about 0.6, uh, plus uh, a reasonable cobalt credit. We'll come back to that. Um, so the current operation consists of a mine, mining about 10 million tonnes a year of, uh, uh, of ore out of uh, some fairly shallow pits with about a one-to-one -one strip ratio. You can see, uh, uh, see one of those uh, on the right-hand side of the slide there. Um, and that feeds into uh, a beneficiation plant. And this is the, the key asset for Ravensthorpe because that plant then separates out the two different ore types um, and uh, upgrades the ore into uh, about uh, a 1.2% nickel feed for the plant. So only about 3 2 million tonnes a year goes into the plant. That saves a lot of cash. Um, the product from Ravensthorpe is called a mixed hydride precipitate. It's the green stuff on the right-hand side coming off the conveyor there. Um, that's actually quite amenable to upgrading into uh, a nickel sulphate, which of course is the uh, uh, desirable commodity these days for the, uh, the EV sector. Um, and so we'll be talking to John shortly after this talk about how, uh, how you go about that. Um, but that's one of the reasons for bringing POSCO in on a deal like this is that they are a company who's very heavily uh, invested into the, um, the cathode uh, uh, side of uh, battery uh, materials. Um, and we'll be talking to them in the future about how to, uh, how to redesign uh, uh, or potentially a capital upgrade of, of the Raymond's Thorpe plant to, uh, to produce a nickel sulfate, sulfate product. Um, Quick bit of geology for the geologists in the room. Um, this is part of the Ravensthorpe uh, uh, Greenstone Belt, um, a group of uh, the Bandelup Ultramafix, uh, which includes some nice spinifex te textured comatiites, uh, amongst other uh, mafic ultramafix sequences. Uh, and a particular unit of this has been preferentially weathered to produce really quite a nice uh, upgraded uh, nickel laterite cap. Um, so there's a whole series of deposits. Uh, we started uh, on uh, one called Halley's and then Hale Bop, and now we're just getting going on a new one called Shoemaker Levy. Um, the nickel mineralization occurs in limonite ore, and you can see that on the far left of the slide there. Um, it's uh, riddled with little veins of, of silica, which is part of the reason it upgrades so well, because that silica can be pulled out in a, uh, in a series of uh, beneficiation measures. The uh, stuff in the top at the, uh, the middle is a saprolite ore, um, actually still runs quite high grades, and uh, the nickel can be extracted from that at atmospheric uh, uh, pressures, so it doesn't need any, uh, uh, any really uh, uh, pressure leach uh, technology. Um, fairly typical profile on the right-hand side, and you can see a, a, a section through a pit there just showing you some of the, uh, the complexity of the geology in terms of how, uh, how all of that uh, fits together, and these sort of keels of um, limonite ore coming down into the saprolite. So it's not, uh, not quite so simple. You can imagine drilling through that and getting some very different results. So we've spent quite a lot of time actually applying some of our normal exploration technologies to trying to understand um, how these, uh, the variability of the saprolite and, uh, 
uh, limonite ores uh, work, uh, including things like uh, passive seismic, uh, very, very detailed drone magnetics, uh, and uh, downhole petrophysics to try and characterize those ores, uh, and even um, uh, some uh, ground penetrating radar on the bottom, which actually shows the, uh, the cap rock, which is the stuff you have to strip off the top uh, very accurately, such that you can build volume models for the pre-strip. Uh, what makes Ravensthorpe special? Well, as I've mentioned, really the unique characteristic of the ore, um, which was explained to me by the BHP geologists who, uh, during the due diligence, uh, it really is quite unique around the world. Uh, and that's why they developed it, because uh, you can feed 0.6% uh, ore into a beneficiation plant and upgrade it by about, uh, uh, to get 66% uh, of the mass, but about 60% of the metal recovered into uh, an upgraded feed for the plant. So as mentioned, we produce, uh, uh, we generate about 3.2 million tonnes out of the uh, beneficiation plant that goes into the, uh, uh, the processing, uh, uh, the, both the acid plant, uh, the acid um, leach circuit uh, and the, uh, the high pressure uh, leach. So um, the future for this is then to add a, a further um, uh, aspect in terms of generating a, uh, a nickel sulphite product. So Shoemaker Levy is the future for, uh, uh, for really for, for Ravensthorpe. It's a, a very large uh, ore body. It's similar grade to most of the rest of the deposits, um, but much of it is uh, a little distance from the original uh, mine. Uh, so we've had to build a fairly substantial conveyor and a whole load of uh, primary crushing stations. Uh, it's a significant project, 90 million uh, US uh, investment. Um, it involved 93 kilometres of drilling just for the first five-year uh, initial pit um, and, uh, and quite a significant program of evaluation because previously the beneficiation circuit worked on a rather complex set of equations that I think BHP initiated and we tried to improve upon, um, whereby you're basically using proxies to try and predict the, uh, uh, the ore material properties. Uh, We've had some success recently in terms of just diamond drilling on a grid through the deposit, not particularly close spacing, but getting real material to test in a plant on site. Uh, and uh, that appears to be a more accurate way to, uh, to predict uh, what's actually gonna happen once this thing feeds into the plant. Uh, so a couple of pictures there of the, uh, uh, the crusher and the start of the conveyor. The first ore went through that just a few days ago. So uh, it's now a project in action. Um, Interestingly, uh, we had to run the conveyor over the main highway that goes past through Ravensthorpe, and you can just see on the left there uh, uh, an interesting uh, motif uh, uh, drawn on the side of the, uh, the bridge that goes over the top of the highway there. If you ever get down near Ravensthorpe, you might want to have a, have a squeeze at it. You can't really avoid it. Um, so Ravensthorpe, just final uh, words on Ravensthorpe. Really, it's, it's a, actually an incredibly clean source of nickel supply, which is becoming increasingly important for us in these days. Um, it has one of the smallest carbon footprints of any nickel uh, operation globally. That sounds rather remarkable for a nickel laterite, which as you're aware, takes normally a lot of energy. Um, and the reasons for that are that basically we generate all of our power um, on site using uh, an acid plant and the steam that's generated out of that plant drives uh, a series of uh, turbines, both for power on the plant and for heating of the various vessels uh, for the uh, recovery process. Um, and I think there's, uh, there's some really good opportunities to, uh, to improve on that. We're not actually on the, uh, the West Australian grid. We did look at joining the grid some years ago, but actually uh, in some ways we're better off uh, without it. We also source all of our seawater, all of our water from seawater. There's a desalination plant. So uh, in terms of water and power, this is, uh, it ticks all the boxes in terms of a sustainable uh, nickel supply for the future. And I think that's one of the reasons why POSCAS were so keen to, um, to get involved. Um, Here's a deposit you may not have uh, heard of, um, but you probably should have. Uh, this is actually an equivalent sized ore body to the Nova Bollinger deposit, or um, uh, perhaps the, uh, uh, the Jaguar deposit that you, I think, already heard about as part of this conference. Um, it's actually close to half a million, half a million tons of contained nickel, 460,000 tons of odd of contained nickel in total resource. Uh, we put it on the map about uh, eight or 10 years ago as part of our exploration around the Sentinel copper ore body in Zambia. It's actually an entirely sediment hosted nickel ore body, uh, the like of which I've never seen anywhere else in the world, although one or two other examples exist. Um, 
Avebury is a possible one, but uh, I think there are other examples in the Congo that are more, more similar. Um, it's, uh, it's actually got some, uh, some really good grades. It bulks out at about uh, 1%, um, and the resource is uh, 37 million tonnes, almost all of which gets optimised into an early stage pit, uh, about 35 million tonnes at just under a percent. Um, there is a, another small deposit, Enterprise Southwest, uh, just a few hundred metres away, which uh, may or may not get optimised at some stage in the future. The, the key advantage of Enterprise other than being quite a tasty little ore body in its own right, is actually it's only a few kilometres, about 12 kilometres actually, from our Sentinel uh, Trident uh, processing plant, uh, which is currently being used for copper, uh, but was built in mind with a nickel circuit uh, ready to turn on when the nickel price got to the right stage. Um, when that stage is, is open to uh, some conjecture, uh, but certainly we'll be looking at that fairly closely over the next year or two if nickel uh, continues to, uh, to appreciate in its long-term uh, price. Um, for the geologists in the room, a few pictures of the mineralogy there, because it's, uh, it's relatively unusual. Uh, vasite, millerite, uh, nickeliferous pyrite. Uh, it's formed in a, a, a shale lithology and a little graben. Um, and uh, some of the, uh, the grades, which you probably can't read on that side, um, over 100 metres at 2.5% nickel down some of those holes in the middle of that, including 19 metres at over 8%. Uh, so eye-watering numbers in the core of this sediment-hosted nickel deposit, things that you would normally expect in a mafic environment. Uh, we're also exploring for nickel in Finland. Um, we have a history in Finland. We built the Kvitsa mine there some years ago, which we have sold for, to Beliden for $712 million. Um, and uh, we, uh, we truly believe in Finland as a destination for, for sulfide nickel. Uh, we're doing a series of uh, regional exploration uh, uh, opportunities there and um, uh, exciting things that the, the Finns turned out to be really good at, like uh, drone, uh, drone magnetics. Uh, and it's quite easy in Finland to find sulfide boulder trains, including uh, sulfides, but actually tracing them back to their source turns out to be a little bit more complicated, and that's where the geophysics comes in. So we're, we're quite enthused about our current projects in Finland. They're ones that we'll continue uh, pursuing over the next few years uh, as part of our own and joint venture work. Last slide. Western Australia, again, uh, this is a joint venture that we hold up in the Gascoigne region with uh, Dreadnought. Um, and it's, uh, it's a very intriguing prospect. It's a 60 kilometer long uh, mafic, ultramafic dike. Uh, and parts of it, in fact, significant parts of it, hold a lot of uh, blebby sulfides. It remains to be seen what the, the width and uh, potential accumulation of these might be. But some of these sulfide blebs are a couple of centimeters across, as you can see. And they're very high tenor. So that means the proportion of economic to uneconomic uh, sulfides is very high. So uh, it's an interesting prospect and one that we'll be pursuing with uh, uh, some EM. Uh, we've already done lots of sampling and we'll be uh, uh, hopefully be drilling there early in the new year. Uh, and that just about brings the end of the talk and I'll be answering questions after the first three talks. I think we'll be going back. Cheers.